This is kind of a, a more general JavaScript uh, meetup. How uh, how many people are uh, you know hacking on Node? Awesome, awesome. Um, how many people have a full time job where they get to work on Node? Yes, that is amazing. So uh, about two years ago, uh, I packed up my family. I have a family of four, uh, and I decided to move out to San Francisco and you know work on uh, uh, Node full time. Uh, I found it uh, a really great developer experience, and uh, it's been a wild and crazy ride. You know, back then, uh, the only place you could go and, and get paid to do it uh, was in San Francisco and man it's uh, you know the world's changing you know right now uh, Walmart's spinning up hundreds of developers uh, all dedicated programming node and you know they're they're organized like large organizations around the uh, around the world that are uh, basically going there with node um, and it seems like node is becoming the go-to platform if you're starting something fresh um, it, it's it's getting to the point is like why not node um, so um, this talk that I'm going to give tonight is uh, about effective uh, node architectures. It's a little the distillation of, of some of my experience uh, building node uh, you know, products and services for, for production. Uh, a lot of what uh, you know, the module landscape uh, of Node facilitates is this very um, ease of use hacking style uh, that uh, you can kind of spin up a, you know, take the module, uh, hack together a couple of things, throw in some sample code, and be up and running. Um, that's cool, and you know, Node kicks ass for hackathons and whatnot. Um, but you know, the reality of running Node in production, you know, your at the end of the day, it the, the the Node experience it ends up being for you. Uh, your users don't care that it's Node. Could be Perl. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, as long as as long as the the website or service that is up and running, uh, the, the whatever they're trying to accomplish is is there for them. Uh, they don't really care that it has uh, the new shiny behind it, uh, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, so. Um, you know, as uh, you know, as a developer, you want to uh, keep using those those fun tools. Uh, so uh, this talk goes into um, you know what what you need to do to to translate from um, hey, this is a cool idea to uh, bring this into reality. So um, yeah. I'm uh, D. Shaw. Uh, surprise, I'm not a pink unicorn. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> kind of an average dude. Um, but I really like to build things in Node. Um, it's, it's been something that um, I've enjoyed immensely. I, I came to Node from Java land. Uh, I was writing Java and uh, rich client front ends in, in, in JavaScript and back ends in Node. And um, you know, back when the uh, HTML5 APIs began to emerge and we, we began to have uh, web sockets and things like that as, as an alternative to uh, Ajax and uh, you know, different uh, client server communication, um, you know, trying to explore that in Java was absolutely excruciating. And end of the day, what, what I was actually trying to accomplish was uh, just have some sort of back end that would uh, allow me to do web sockets. Uh, so you know, going through the Maven build process, trying to figure out what, wh where to, uh, what to be able to do uh, uh, that, you know, j uh, that stuff in Java, um, then, you know, if you're building things with uh, real-time systems and, and web socks, invariably you want to share the experience with people uh, and host it somewhere 
that's you know absolutely crazy. So uh, you know, back then, I, I uh, you know happened upon Node. Uh, there you know was a now defunct uh, WebSocket server. Uh, uh, maintained by uh, Michael Smith, Mixago, and uh, I dropped that on my computer, and I was up and running, and you know, doing stuff with WebSockets in a matter of minutes. And I was like, "Wow, like this is awesome!" Uh, I would, I could, uh, you know, finally do with the stuff that I wanted to do client side. Uh, you know, develop the interaction that I wanted to do, um, but. I found that that interaction was also facilitated by the back end because, hey, what do you know? This is also JavaScript on the back end. So as I began to um, you know, get beyond what I wanted to accomplish on the front end, I went to the, the back end and, you know, hack it up a bit, change the, the behavior, put in some uh, API, and you know, then I was able to have the sort of same sort of creativity and iteration that I was you know, used to in, in working on client-side code and working on back-end. And uh, I just find it, uh, found it absolutely uh, an extraordinary experience. And uh, after the first node knockout, it was, yeah. Uh, pack up the family, off we go. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, huh? uh, we were living in West Virginia, so uh, uh, we were in, in Morgantown at WVU. Uh, I had uh, gone back to school after uh, dot com and uh, was doing government contracting, lots of uh, really fun sort of East Coast uh, engineering stuff. So defense contracting, uh, healthcare contracting, education, uh, worked in all those markets. Um, and I started out my career as uh, a uh, independent developer, and you know, had a business that did um, you know, full service media uh, and sort of branding uh, uh, web stuff. And I really missed the uh, the contact with end users and you know stuff really uh, you know, being used by people. Uh, I, I worked on a uh, multi-million dollar contract for uh, the Department of Defense that lasted uh, five years and you know it was a really cool project, great experience in, in the actual development flow. We had a, a really compelling team, um, you know very diverse uh, group of people building the, the service. Um, then uh, there was a uh, a leadership change. Shut the entire thing down. Gone off. The, you know, never never used again. Uh, so uh, you know, having that that feedback cycle of you know building products that that real people are using, and you know, as an engineer, um, you know, some of the greatest satisfaction that I get is is from from doing that and and having people be excited about uh, using the stuff that I build. So, um, you know, Mike uh, pretty much blew this slide for me. Uh, <laughs> I, I came out and uh, worked as lead engineer of, of Storify. Uh, for a couple of these startups, I uh, basically, um, you know, came in as, uh, you know, employee number, you know, in the single digits, uh, I was employee number two at Storify. Uh, went through uh, public beta launch. Um, at Spreecast, I uh, was focused on scaling Socket.io. Uh, so that was uh, a really interesting experience, uh, getting a lot of appreciation and, um, and not appreciation for Socket.io through that experience. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it, it was it was good. Um, I I've had the opportunity. So uh, as I mentioned, I you know one of the the, the, the catalysts of uh, me um, uh, 
taking the extra step and and you know deciding to, to go out to San Francisco to, to work on Node Photo Time was you no know, knockout. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, you know continuing to contribute to Node Knockout and you know I'm kind of on the advisor team there. Uh, and uh, it, it you know it was a meaningful experience to, to me and you know I try uh, like Node Bots Day uh, to you know share that experience with other people who are uh, stoked about uh, doing cool things. Uh, for yeah, the past uh, year and a half, I've worked at Voxer, uh, one of the, uh, our, our title's going away, uh, one of the biggest uh, installations uh, of, of Node uh, in the world. Um, they have uh, 40 million users, all of the back ends built on Node, and it is, um, a IO bound service and probably like the definitive uh, use case for Node. Um, and I'm going to share some of the, the, the takeaways uh, uh, of that experience in this talk. Um, and uh, about the same time as I joined Boxer, uh, I, I uh, uh, co founded the, the Node Firm, and Node Firm's mission is to help businesses be successful with Node. Uh, we, we really uh, try to drive uh, a constructive workplace. So we actually focus on you know, training and architectural services and support services to help businesses who want to use Node uh, go in, understand it, be successful, and uh, you know, not try to uh, do it for people. Because uh, you know, the, the, the mission is uh, to give other people the opportunity to uh, work on that. If, that's, if they're excited about it, um, you know, hopefully they'll be um, able to work on that. So, um, the, the foundation of building an effective production system actually turns out to, uh, to be doing less. Uh, it, it seems weird, uh, but the, the most efficient computation that you can do is the computation that you don't do. Uh, so if you can be uh, concise and efficient with the work that you do, uh, you can do more of it, right? Um, so in developing architectures for uh, production systems in Node, uh, I kind of like to think that uh, or in terms of, you know, maybe a, a functional programming style uh, of, of service architectures and, you know, having very isolated uh, services that are, are composable and contributing to the overall architecture uh, of an organization. Um, so when you're when you're building out a system, you um, you really want to uh, have that process be um, very clear in, in what it does, uh, and uh, we'll go into uh, why that becomes meaningful in, in Node. Um, so there is. A, a a reasonable point where um, node can do everything. Uh, you can have uh, a process that uh, you know is an express app and it has Socket.io shoved in there and it's serving your API and it's doing everything and that's awesome, especially if that's like your website. Uh, you know, your personal website. The, like, you don't need to architect your personal website to, uh, you know, be the, the, the definition of uh, the, you know, the, the uh, most elaborate service architecture. Uh, you can, if, if the service needs of, of what you're building are, you know, going to serve in, you know, the hundreds of thousands of, of users and, uh, you know, for, for me, for example, it, for my website, if it happens to, like, get slammed by Hacker News, 
cool. I, I really don't uh, care that much about my personal website, um, you know, getting totally slammed. Uh, you know, hopefully people will come back to it uh, later. But it, you know, it's designed to sort of share a little piece of me with the world. Uh, it's not designed to uh, really make me any money or uh, do anything extraordinary. So um, you know, that is. Um, you know, a compelling reason just just keep keep things things simple uh, and, and put things together. Um, there, as you're building a a production system, the the, the needs of uh, the service architecture will, will end up evolving. Um, if you're, you know, building um, any of these all-in-one things, uh, I have a, a module called uh, Mixture. Um, I, I created this back when I was doing um, the socket I/O scaling stuff. Uh, so invariably, to uh, orchestrate what a system with a bunch of uh, service needs around socket I/O was, uh, I would have you know, 15 terminals open and, you know, there would be uh, 10 socket IO servers, a couple express servers, uh, there are some back-end components with socket IO announced that were sending data from the infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, every time I, I spun up that, that was, you know, absolutely crazy. Um, and, you know, the things around cluster uh, that you know gave you the ability to uh, spin up a specific server for service and um, you know fork out requests to um, you know a a a a uh, specific process which ends up being forked. Uh, Mixture allows you to define the you know the foundation of the service and then uh, spin up n uh, of those processes in uh, kind of an express expressive way. So. Uh, if you're looking for uh, a way to um, you know pull in and experiment with uh, a lot of things together, uh, worth checking out. So um, all of the things together, that blob of uh, of app with socket IO um, has some great advantages. It, it's, it's, it's a single op, uh, execution point. You can you know, manage that and deploy that fairly efficiently. There, there's not much operational overhead. Uh, it, you, know, you just fire that off and uh, you know that, that that infrastructure that you've built out is going to be effective. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to uh, be you know, Facebook grade uh, if you're not attending to it. But the, the purpose of this talk is uh, to take us beyond, um, you know, the, 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 the personal and into production services. Um, and if you, what you're building is built for production, built for your users, um, you know, you need to design it for the scale that your use case is, is going to serve. Um, so if, if I'm building a product that it is intended to be used by hundreds of thousands of users uh, or more, then I am going to have to, by necessity, build that for scale. That uh, s simplistic approach of, of you know, designing the architecture um, it would be a disservice, eventually, to those users. Because, uh, yeah, it's cool, and I, you know, uh, all I have to do is, is set up that one site. But if, um, you know, the... Um, the usage of that site begins to be, um, you know, robust and begins to become specialized. Uh, that, uh, you know, that ends up being a disservice to you, to your users. Um, so, what do I mean by uh, specialized? Um, so, this uh, this architecture has 
Socket.io. So it has a real-time component. It has an API. It has uh, a, a web server component. Maybe it's serving up static files. Uh, these are all different utility that the, the same process is, uh, is servicing to your users. And um, you know, at any given point, one of those could take off, and you know your your, um, your chat service becomes you know really uh, active. If everything is all there together, then as the the usage of your chat service begins to expand, um, what happens if, if it's if it's together? It ends up degrading the performance and experience of your users that are you know maybe interacting acting with it in different ways. Um, the you know, node has um, you know, an event loop and you know, it's, it's a single threaded environment and um, you know, it is scheduling the tasks that it has on hand. If all the tasks that it's scheduling it are you know, tasks that uh, aren't related to the, the, the service that the, the uh, users are coming to, to uh, access the service, then you are going to end up doing um, them a uh, disservice. So um, what you need to do is, is begin to start uh, defining what those things do, what they uh, are special, uh, what's special about them. Um, and uh, you know, I, I've defined at least four things there. So a, a real-time system, uh, an API, the web server, and you know, maybe even serving up static files. So um, those are great opportunities for specialization. Um, now, when you're in the generalizations category, um, we, we mentioned Socket.io uh, and Express, great tools for that. Um, it, you know, merging together website and API, that it's kind of a, a natural fit. Um, I really recommend that uh, if you're, you're thinking about uh, Express and uh, considering bringing that service to scale, and if you're si considering bringing, uh, you know, having a API as the foundation of, of what you're building out, um, Restify is the, um, the tool that, that Joint has used to, to build out their entire architecture. Uh, very rich, um, you know, HTTP driven uh, you know, data architecture. And uh, it is extreme, like Mar uh, Mark Cavage is an amazing individual. Uh, if you have a chance to listen to him on, on NodeUp, uh, extremely smart guy. Uh, and uh, Restify is a, a really well engineered uh, piece of software. And uh, it's built with uh, modern Node in, in mind. So if you uh, get to the point where you want to incorporate streams and detrace into that, all, all those hooks uh, and the capabilities there. Uh, something not on this slide um, that I also uh, recommend in this category, uh, Happy. Uh, Aaron Hammer's framework the, the, that he's rolling out at Walmart, he's really uh, nailed a lot of the, the concept and uh, um, you know, Restify really Riffs on Express and very much uh, adapts that API. Uh, Aaron's uh, going in a little bit uh, more modular direction and has defined possibly the most sane enterprise architecture uh, sort of philosophy behind enterprise architecture that I, I've ever heard uh, and uh, you know, is, is building uh, their entire service all around NPM so individuals can be individuals and have different code styles and, and contribute and work on isolated uh, code pieces and you know, it all comes together through uh, the power of NPM and um, you know, have uh, a, a very well-defined uh, coordination and plug-in architecture. So uh, not there, but like definitely um, yeah, check that out if you're, you're building something new. 
happy, H-A-P-I. Um, what? H-A-P-I dot J-S. Uh, I think it's got some, some Google juice. Um, yeah, different enough. Spumco, yeah, it's very uh, Ren and Stimpy. Everything is Ren and Stimpy, and the the module names are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's fantastic that it's such a a, a big organization. Uh, he is just having a blast with it. So, um, yeah, Aaron's great. Um, so uh, we, you know, we, we put those together uh, and, and we begin to ask uh, the, if, those, if we, we maybe put too many things in, in the same basket. Um, and uh, you know, we begin to have to consider some of the trade-offs that you have to uh, you know, look at as, as you're evolving that, that system and uh, making uh, decisions. So um, then, yeah. The um, having all the, the, those various uh, load pieces coming in and hitting that, even if you're distributing that out, um, you know, it it will uh, begin to stress the conjoined process uh, in uh, in ways that um, are not efficient and. Uh, um, you know, if you have everything as one one system, if you begin to introduce uh, new complexity into your API services, um, that error state um, and the crashes that um, invariably will will uh, uh, creep into your system. Uh, impact your entire service. So you introduce a bug in your real-time system and your API users uh, can't access the system because you, you have unreliability. So uh, you know, beginning to consider pulling those out. All right, you know, there's this API. Does the API need to be with the web server? No. Uh, let's pull that out. Let that evolve as a um, as an independent unit, um, there there are some negatives as you go there. So the, the you know it, it begins to have you know organizational uh, benefit to you know have things uh, separated out and user benefit for you know the reliability of the components and you know if something messes up they you know you, you aren't bringing down uh, uh, everything else. But the you know, I've just described you know four or five different services. Those four or five different services probably have you know five, ten, twenty different instances of those processes. Um, that begins to become a lot more complex to deploy. Uh, you know, managing dependencies, you know, pushing that out. You, you, there, it isn't without uh, you know real world trade offs that that you. Um, you know, one, one should begin to uh, you know aggressively drive uh, specialization. Uh, you it, it does have a, a significant impact. So um, you know, you you will take a hit uh, in your deployment, the complexity of your, your repos, all the different things that you have to orchestrate, uh, provision. Uh, but again, it's uh, it's for your users, and uh, um, most of the time that that complexity is, is worth it. But it's also worth considering that um, you don't need to to push too aggressively for that. You know, don't, th there's uh, a a premature optimization in uh, an architecture like that of you know creating too many uh, discrete pieces that you just uh, end up with an orchestration nightmare. And if you don't have um, you know your system checks in place, so uh, maybe most of the time you have your eyes on the website, uh, but the API is down. You know, that kind of sucks. So uh, <laughs> uh, you know, making sure that as you begin to uh, provision and 
uh, you know, plan out the, uh, the you know the future of your universe, you understand that you have to uh, now manage way uh, you know a lot more different things, and uh, you know, make sure you you begin to have um, the, the tools to to be uh, be managing that. So in uh, in building architectures. Uh, possibly the greatest thing that you can do is uh, have your systems be as dumb as, as possible. So uh, what that means is, uh, you know, if you have, you know, two to one million processes of the same type, any one of those processes can handle the request in the same way. Uh, they, they don't need a session, they don't need anything. All it is is, um, you know, just responsible for handling uh, data. And, you know, t hold on to that as long as possible. Uh, and you can take that and incorporate that into components of your architecture. So if at your edge you need to you know, establish sessions and manage that, uh, that's fine. The services behind that don't need to have all that stuff. They can, uh, you, you can attach that metadata into uh, the request and then your Edge service can you know encapsulate that and make a uh, a, a dumb request a, against a, a large pool of services and um, you know that that's fantastic. Keep keep those pieces in your architecture uh, as long as you can. They're they're insanely valuable uh, and. Uh, um, they will allow you to sleep sleep more at night and uh, enjoy your weekends. Um, some of the the things that uh, can can go into uh, a dumb dumb cluster are uh, your static file serving. Um, like I mentioned, uh, many of uh, your API needs. Uh, an API uh, is not only about your end users. So, you know, a, a, the, the API, the facade that you have and exposed to uh, your users, uh, you know, has uh, you know, possibly a different set of needs. But as you begin to uh, develop that, this constellation of services, you also have uh, these internal APIs that um, you'll begin to, to develop. Uh, those can be uh, much simpler. Um, web servers, uh, if uh, they just have simple routes, uh, static pages, all that stuff, uh, really great. Um, and even as you go into uh, you know minimal client server uh, interaction, um, the you you can keep those uh, dumb with a lot of, with, with as uh, little local state as possible in, in the processes. Um, so. Some very traditional tools for um, you know facilitating that. Um, you know the, these are outside of Node, uh, but if you want to throw some more Node in there, um, then I I recommend uh, looking at uh, some of the work that Subsec's done with uh, Seaport and Bouncy. Uh, the entirety of uh, Node Jitsu is built off uh, Node HTTP proxy, uh, so you, know, you can uh, really uh, orchestrate a lot of uh, services with that. And at Voxer, we have a, a module that Danny Coates wrote uh, called Pooley, and uh, uh, for the longest time, I thought that. Uh, Pooley was the worst name ever. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Danny's an ex-Marine, and apparently it's a Marine joke. Uh, Pooley is a, uh, uh, a new recruit. Um, so there's a joke there. Uh, it's really dry, like Danny. Uh, and uh, pretty awesome. But uh, the, the code is, is great. So. And it's really good at, at managing a, a lar large, uh, large pool of services and uh, maintaining health and uh, um, you know, routing requests amongst those uh, processes. Um, 
So in order to facilitate this, this sort of dumbness of them, uh, there's usually a definitive source of data. So if all of those requests uh, end up going back to a, a database and you know the, the processes are are um, you know just um, you know managing and returning data from your database um, you uh, it, it's a great great uh, opportunity to, to keep those processes dumb and make a lot of them um, you know node is happy that way uh, it distributes the load uh, across um, you know a lot of event loops uh, and uh, uh, node can work through that very efficiently and the single process overhead uh, of having a single node process is, is fairly minimal um, so, if you must, then uh, uh, in, in, your, in your architecture, uh, adding in session affinity uh, means maintaining local state in, in your server. Uh, you can push some of this out. You can possibly push uh, some of your sessions out to Redis and uh, scale it there. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, you're going down the rabbit hole uh, of complexity and uh, having to uh, return to a single instance uh, of your server means that uh, you're holding state in, in your process and uh, uh, means that the cost of you, uh, you know, bringing that uh, particular instance down uh, increases and um, you know, you, you have to worry about, um, you know, redeployments there. Uh, so uh, really uh, minimize in your architecture the amount uh, of session affinity that you, you end up having to do. And, uh, you know, push it into a corner and keep it isolated. Keep it a, a, at your edge. Uh, you know, don't let it creep into the rest of, uh, of your services. Um, so um, some of the things that, that you can use to, to uh, um, you know, provision that out, uh, Hoproxy and Nginx are you know, very traditional tools for that. Um, I really recommend uh, Michael Rogers' uh, Stud Proxy. Uh, it's uh, a um, lightweight, um, SSL terminator that uh, allows you to uh, maintain that session affinity. Uh, so, um, you know, Ha and Nginx are uh, a little bit more complex tools. Uh, Stud does uh, very little, and uh, uh, Stud Proxy is a uh, lightweight addition uh, on top of that that uh, you know, really. Um, uh, you know, helps to keep that sane. Also, um, it, you know, not really uh, germane to this discussion, but uh, if you need to do SSL uh, termination, um, Voxer last year uh, had all of our SSL going through through Node. Uh, it was awesome, uh, but we had to pull the plug and. Uh, um, we uh, we ended up uh, going with stud. So why do we have to pull the plug on uh, uh, SSL and Node? Uh, it pretty much boils down to having smart clusters. Uh, so uh, Voxer as a you know, real-time I/O service uh, maintains a lot of state at the edge, so it can dynamically route data to live users as fast as possible. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll uh, uh, talk about the implementation in detail in a second, but while, while I'm discussing uh, uh, SSL, um, so why, why, did they, uh, uh, why did SSL hurt us so much? Um, so uh, the 
every user basically has a, an assigned server that uh, they go back to. So they have a home. Um, that means that when we uh, restart a process and it comes back up, an entire flood of users, so you know, thousands of users will come back and hit the, the server at the same time, the, the same server at the same time. And uh, when that process is doing uh, the SSL handshake, that's a lot of crypto, that's a lot of computation, not a good place for Node. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if you were to sit there and sort of watch the logs go by, um, you know, uh, and when you, you know, SSH into a, a server, it's kind of this blinding wall of white. Uh, and it's a lot of data going past. Uh, when we, we have one of these restart events, uh, you basically see things stop and ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And it's like, ah! And the excruciating part of that is while that's happening, no one else is getting serviced. That process is incapable of doing anything else for any other individual. So all those users that are, 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 are trying to do something are you know, completely backlogged and j just waiting for uh, their connection to establish. So, um, when I, when I uh, talk about the uh, consistent hash ring architecture at, at Voxer, um, I, I invariably get this, oh cool, uh, woo, fancy kind of a thing. Um, but there are some, some real trade-offs and, and some real um, architectural pain that uh, are associated with that. Um, it is a necessity for a, a, a uh, service like Voxer uh, because of the live routing, but if it's not a necessity for what you're building, go back to dumb. Run back to dumb as fast as you can, uh, and uh, you know that will be uh, a way more effective uh, architectural strategy than uh, you know incorporating a you know the the, the fancy logic that uh, a consistent hash ring will will bring because uh, it will also come back and, and hurt you in in, in these ways. Um, so. Explain that. Um, the, the, the properties of a uh, consistent hash ring and you know, why they're meaningful is um, you know, when you uh, select a, uh, a point of you know, w however uh, your hash is organized, um, you know that you will go to a deterministic location. So in that hash rate, you can go and say, all right, uh, my name's D. Shaw, where do I go? Uh, and the architecture says, you go right there. Cool, that's awesome. Um, and you know, that routing, that deterministic routing is extremely effective in you know, trying to uh, minimize the latency of passing messages through a, a complex uh, HTTP system. And, and, and Voxer is HTTP, is voice over HTTP. Uh, HTTP is awesome. Don't, uh, don't, don't uh, knock HTTP. Uh, it's always a sensible first choice. Um, so uh, another cool thing about the uh, consistent hash ring um, is uh, the impact of uh, you know, adding or uh, removing a node to that architecture is, is very small. So if uh, you know, you have this deterministic structure and you want it to go to the same place, when you uh, resize it, when you have to, uh, you know, bring a service online, when servers, you know, servers die, that's like um, the reality of uh, where we are and, uh, you know, even, you know, just as bad, uh, if not worse, in, in the cloud. Um, you know, at Spreecast, we had something on the order of, of a 20% attrition on our AWS servers. Uh, you know, they just, 
uh, randomly die and be gone, and you know we'd have to scramble to to spin up another one. So having a an architecture that is is built uh, around uh, minimizing the impact of you know a particular node uh, going away and probably staying away, uh, you know, is sane. Um, but it's you know it's really a lot of complexity. It's a massive amount of state um, uh, that uh, exists in your process. Um, you know, pulling that uh, out to the edge, having to aggressively cast that um, is really only worth it if you absolutely need it. So. Um, you know, don't necessarily uh, go there unless uh, unless you really really need it. Um, so if you want to, if you have to uh, go and uh, build out a consistent hash string, um, I really recommend uh, Third Eden's uh, Node hash string. It's probably the the best, most well well maintained. Um, the uh, hash ring that uh, Brian Noguchi uh, built, and I believe some of the foundations of uh, some of the systems they were building with Derby um, uh, is C++ and uh, I think is uh, getting a bit dated. Uh, so, you know, worth checking out, um, worth, you know, exploring if uh, you go, you know, down to the, the next step is um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, uh, Voxer is strangely missing there. So, um, you know, there is a lot of logic in the hash ring that is you know, the foundation of, of Voxer's architecture. This is very Voxery. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think it's almost appropriate that um, there aren't that many uh, resources out there, so maybe it discourages people from, uh, you know, not adding that level of complexity to their system if, uh, if they don't need it. Um, so if you're considering, um, you know, building a, a, an infrastructure that needs that level of complexity, uh, spending the time to tune and define uh, precisely what you need uh, is, is probably worth while because uh, you're, you, you've put a lot of conceptual work on those nodes and you're going to have to have a very deep understanding uh, of, those, uh, of, that, of that infrastructure to, um, you know, to manage it effectively. So um, overarching takeaway as uh, you begin to, to build these uh, large production infrastructures, uh, you know, select the, the right tool for the task, keep things as simple as possible, uh, you know, the best computation is the computation that you don't do, and you know, the, the simplest architecture uh, will uh, you know, make, make you uh, uh, and your family happier. Uh, because you can go do other things. Um, and you know, this is a Node logo, but uh, uh, one of the cool things that I love about this logo is uh, that sort of weird uh, background of uh, little nodes out spreading it around. Uh, and that's really cool because that's actually what um, you know uh, big production uh, node architectures end up looking like. A bunch of, uh, of, of specialized processes, constellations of, uh, of processes uh, interacting amongst each other and uh, you know providing services. So um, thanks a lot. <laughs>